What's up everyone, this is Dr. Tan from season nine of Alone and we are talking about the medical side of survival specifically for episode four. So we're touching base with uh, some of the things that Terry and Benji go over, a little bit of the survival strategies, but a lot about the medical side because as we're moving forward in the season, we're finding more medical things happen. So if you haven't checked the other videos, check out my other episode four medical recaps and let's get started. So if this is the first time that you're seeing this video, my name is Dr. Timogen Tan. I'm a medical doctor up in Owen Sound, Ontario, working in the ER and hospital setting. And I was on a survival show called Alone. I have some military background as well and training in Arctic warfare and survival. So that's my little niche. And uh, today we are talking about long-term survival and some of the medical things that happen. So we are on episode four of Alone and there are so many different medical topics. Last time we talked about severe constipation and hemorrhoids. So if you are interested in, in how you would prevent that and treat that in the field, check out that other video. Today we talk about Terry and Benji with topics like submersion injury, drowning in cold water, fixing things with pine and pine pitch, and also beaver processing and hygiene and some of the things that we have to look out for. And lastly, severe muscle cramps and lightheadedness when people feel like they're gonna pass out. So if that type of stuff interests you, consider subscribing and click the notification button. I'm trying to pump out at least one medical video a week and we have Q and A's from the contestants of season nine and of alone and all also some recaps as well. Before we start, question of the day, what are some of the gear that you've seen on screen that you really like? Because what we're doing with the cast of season nine is reaching out to these companies and hosting a huge giveaway at the end of our finale. So if you want some awesome free stuff, let us know what you want and put in the comments. All right, so to start this episode off, lots of talk about beavers. So Benji got a beaver and Terry is scouting out for a beaver. Benji was able to retrieve it after shooting it last episode. So Benji took out the guts, made a little gut pile and then left most of the skin on and dragged it to his camp. And the thought process with that is to avoid as much contamination and dirt on the, the meat itself. Definitely a good idea to leave a gut pile very far away from your campsite because that's uh, pretty stinky stuff that would attract that bear and processing it all in one situation is a pretty tedious task for a fatty thing like a bear or a beaver because what you have to do is uh, when you're taking out the fat you have to take it out from the skin itself because when you're taking out the fat you're trying to separate it from the meat and the skin. And sometimes the easiest way to do that is actually blunt dissection. So putting a hole and then pushing with your knuckles, your fingers between the meat and the skin and trying to get around that. We'll see how Benji processes this on episode four. To save some time, it looks like Benji separates the skin and the meat using a sharp knife. One really cool thing that we see Benji do is on that gut pile, it looks like he has some plastic, maybe it looks like a bread bag that he found as trash. And he puts a lot of the guts and grossness in there and then inverts it, puts the guts in front of the camera and then puts that plastic bag over a trail cam. So you see that bear come up right to the trail cam and lick it. So very interesting shot. What would have been really cool is to see him set up a blind or some kind of tree stand because even though we're out there with our bows, that 12 to 20 meter distance is still pretty close, especially for a charging bear. So for my comfort level, I would have probably wanted to be in a tree stand. How about you guys? And as the episode goes on, we see Benji processing the beaver meat for smoking. And one thing you have to note is these have to be super, super thin slices of meat because any undercooked meat in the middle can grow bacteria. And there are different types of toxins and bacteria that grows on cooked meat versus raw meat. So that can be pretty dangerous if it's thick. And that becomes an issue when you are smoking things that are close to bones. So smoking a rack of ribs, not the best idea because it's really hard for that smoke to penetrate the meat next to the bone. So you have a lot of bacterial overgrowth there. For things around the joints, the inside the skull and all those ligaments, and um, things that are harder to take out really thin strips of meat, I'd probably recommend boiling it and overboiling it. So as you know, in a crock pot or a slow cooker, the longer it's in there, the more tender that stuff uh, comes off. And when you're thinking about the feast or famine type of uh, approach to things and you're eating as much as you can when you can, taking from all those scraps from the difficult to uh, take meats is a good idea. And essentially, you're also taking a lot of nutrients from the spinal cords, the brain, the eyeballs, all the organs, and also the ligaments and tendons, which has 
a lot of nice collagen for it, which we need out there. So how long does it actually take to smoke meat? This varies for different types of animals like fish versus uh, red meats and depends on uh, what kind of smoke. Some people do hot smoking, some people do cold smoking. Cold smoking be the preferred kind of method for this and uh, that's when you have a smoldering, a kind of smoke of hardwood preferably. So out there we had plentiful alder, especially on the shorelines that we could have used for smoking because if you use something that has a lot of resin like the spruce out there with uh, a lot of those oils that does expel a decent amount of toxins in your smoked meat and plus when you smoke alder it has this nutty aroma that's really really pleasant so preferably a cold smoke over multiple multiple hours and we see a lot of people smoking for the greater part of the day some telltale signs is when you crack it in the middle it is pretty hard and looks like jerky on the inside if you see any raw bits it needs to go back and dehydrate more and also be smoked through and through one thing that isn't really mentioned is the energy required to process protein specifically meats so on a scale of easiness and how much oxygen and energy calories you need to digest and process and turn your food into energy it goes from the easiest being sugars carbs starches and then more hard on the fats and protein side of things and this becomes a huge issue when all you're eating is protein because it's taking energy to process that down and in addition to that the harder your body works to digest the more energy you're using and that's one of the reasons why people with lean gain significantly lose weight this is such an important concept because not only does it take a lot of energy to process proteins and meats, it also takes oxygen too. So when you're at higher altitudes, it's really preferable that you load up on sugar and carbs because that's easily digestible. And at the same time, when you're at altitude and experiencing some altitude sickness, you are incredibly nauseated, do not want to eat, and might have vomiting. So things that are very easily digest, doesn't require a lot of oxygen or energy to digest, kind of makes up the majority of what your diet should be out there at altitude. And one thing you can do to make your smoked meat extra savory is after you're done smoking it you can put it in a bag filled with salt and it just tastes so so good and last thing I would add is to rehydrate your meat so it already takes a lot of energy so make it easier on your body by putting it in a stew or soup adding different types of nutrients like berries roots vegetation and really having something of decent sustenance because just eating it like jerky may not be the most efficient way to do it and it can make it pretty constipated too in regards to hand hygiene it is super difficult especially in uh, Benji's location it, it doesn't look like he's processing his meat in a location that has a very fast moving river I think he processes it down in camp or near camp and you don't necessarily need to wash your meat but if it's contaminated or spoiled if there was a gut shot or any kind of manipulation of the gastric tract which is pretty likely there can be contamination with bacteria and also parasites quite easily and if you're not keen on washing your hands afterwards it's likely the case that you're touching your face, near your nose, your mouth, your eyes, all these mucous membranes easily transmit uh, those bacteria and cause issues for you in the field. One very feasible way of helping with sanitation is having multiple wash basins. If you have access to a container, great. If you don't, things that you can do to make containers, whether that's with clay, you don't necessarily need to fire it as long as it's able to hold water, that's great. Or birch bark, which we talk about in our previous episodes about how to mold it using just a little bit of heat and putting clothes pins on the corners to make a little wash basin. Now if you have a multitude of wash basins, two or three, you can start getting the grime off of one of them, move to one that you can um, make primitive soap in, and then the last one for a rinse. And uh, this is something that we did very commonly in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's just a small, small basin and a tiny bit of water, tiny bit of soap, and just washing it, making it really soapy, and then washing it with a little bit of water uh, made it so that our hand hygiene was really good. And we were eating with our hands for the most part. So it goes to show you, after after six months being there doing that very simple routine and none of us getting sick it does work some of you may be asking well you don't want to waste your fat on making soap because soap is technically fat plus a base like white wood ash and a little bit of water that mixture makes that soap when you're processing a beaver down or a bear down you are getting fat all over your hands so instead of making actual bars of soap what you can do since you're already processing it down is to have a little container of white ash lie so after you're done that process you can just put a little bit of white ash on your hands, put 
a little bit of water and then go through those sanitation buckets and then really have some clean hands afterwards. And then when you're trying to eat, I would highly, highly recommend that you uh, use utensils, whether that's a spoon, a fork, chopsticks, whatever you're fancy, as long as your hands are not really touching your mouth or your nose as much as possible. Next, we see Terry stalking a beaver. On the first time Terry sees it, he decides not to take that shot. And when I talked to him off screen, one of the things that he was noticing was that beaver going kind of at full speed left and right towards him away from him and really he couldn't make that ethical shot in a survival situation a lot of people were commenting on social media they would have taken the shot but the problem is if you don't have that clear shot that you're confident about taking you might be losing that arrow and that game and even though this is a survival-esque situation it is not a true survival situation we can get pulled but the decision is whether that shot is worth that five hundred thousand dollars prize money so let me know what you would have done in that situation and if you're a hunter specifically if you're a hunter let me know if you would have taken that shot fortunately we see terry a few days later taking down that beaver having a really good shot and having to wade for it the big difference the second time around is that terry mentioned that the beaver would swim and then stop so the speed at which the beaver was going wasn't as as fast as the previous day so he was more comfortable taking that shot and it was such a good one but one thing I wanted to talk about is cold water submersion because Terry had to retrieve that beaver in the water so cold water submersion injuries and the things that happen to your body are super important to know because it is something that can kill you especially in the winter we see Terry take off his clothes and go slowly into the water that means that when he gets out of the water he has some dry clothes that he can pat down and also change into which is super important for mild hypothermia and don't worry, I'll be talking about severe hypothermia once the winter hits. So if you want to check that video out, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification button. Now the dangerous part of submersion in cold water, even in the summer, is when water gets into your mouth. So it is super important whether you fall through the ice or are going into the water to keep your head and hopefully some of your chest above the water, whether that's with a flotation device or closing your mouth if you're falling in. Last summer in this area, in the Bruce Peninsula, we had five five drowning victims from cold water submersion in the summer. What happens is your body's first response to getting splashed with cold water is to have an, what they call an agonal breath. You go like that, suck in water, and it goes to your vocal cords. The majority of drowning victims don't have lungs full of water. They actually don't have a whole lot of water in there. What happens is that cold water touches your vocal cords and then it spasms and it's kind of like you're choking yourself out. So you lose consciousness and then you are not able to self-rescue. So going in, even though it's super painful, going in slow is a good idea in these colder environments and to be very mindful of the speed of the river. If it was any faster, I would have recommend going in with also a very sturdy stick about a thumb to two thumbs thick that you can use as almost a third leg to wade into the water. Interestingly, there's a way to reduce that reflex, that agonal breath with cold weather training. So this is something kind of popular rise in the past a few years via the Wim Hof method. So it's cold exposure therapy and it has a lot of health benefits, a lot of mental health benefits, and it does reduce that agonal breath response because your body gets used to it. It starts with breathing exercises, then exposure to cold showers, and then increasing the duration of how long you shower in the cold. Really interesting concept. Definitely recommend if you are into meditation or increasing your mental fortitude and also want some cold exposure therapy. And just as side note, I think Terry mentions using pine or pine sap. It is such an amazing resource out there. One thing that happened to many of us because we had a few good days in base camp orientation is we got sunburned and specifically burnt on the lips. It is agonizing having sunburns on the lips and you're always kind of wetting your lips and smacking them. That makes it worse and it cracks and it's super irritating. One thing you can do is have a moisture barrier. So you just get some clear pine sap, the gooey stuff, and put it on your lips. Does wonders. Same thing for a lot of wounds after you properly clean it and oftentimes you just need to decrease the bacterial burden by properly washing it preferably with pressure so if you have a one centimeter cut uh, or half an inch that's about a hundred milliliters of uh, pressure wash and that's typically enough to remove enough bacteria so your body can use its natural immune response to kill off the rest so after 
sure it's properly washed just with cooled boiled water and maybe drop that a height if you don't have a syringe for pressure that can decrease a lot of the bacteria and then you can use some pine sap to kind of seal it off and uh, it really helps with those small little nicks another thing pine sap is really good for is making fires it's something that i use very regularly with my feather sticks so i would find a dead free standing about this big chop it in the middle chop it again and then make little tinders and then feathers out of that if you haven't seen what that looks like check out my previous video on episode one and two and then i would put a little bit of pine sap in it whether that's hard or a little sticky and that turns it into a candle and really makes sure that that initial fire is consistent and uh, you can rely on that and some people can make glue out of it if you have a container whether that's a primitive container or you can use a tin if you're lucky like Juan Pablo mix in some pine pitch some charcoal black stuff and also rabbit poo if you can so something that is a little fibrous so the combination of the the two you have to mix it up a little bit the majority is the pine sap a little bit of the charcoal a little bit of the um, rabbit poop mix it together and it turns into almost this very glassy looking glue that when heated you can use it repeatedly for your arrow fletchings uh, to repair equipment and so forth all right to wrap the things up i want to introduce two really important concepts cramping really bad muscle spasms and also lightheadedness feeling like you might pass out because there's a lot of things that can happen when you're feeling that way so cramping just like running a marathon or playing a sports can happen very regularly it happens even more often when you're malnourished you're dehydrated and you don't have electrolytes one of the things that you can do out there is to make sure you're hydrating at least three to four liters a day because we're actively moving we're building shelters we're actively hunting we're setting traps we're doing a lot out there and not only that if you're only eating protein out there and protein breakdown products like urea is in your bloodstream one way to help combat the side effects and the weird feeling that you feel when you have high concentrations of those protein waste products in your bloodstream is to drink a lot of water and to dilute it now the balance is not drinking an astronomical amount of water like 10 liters of water and making your electrolytes out of whack because it's so diluted so that's the balance you have to do so typically and want to also supplement your electrolytes so that's why bringing that extra ration uh, was super important to me I'll be talking about it separately in my 10 item video but electrolytes that are super important not only sodium chloride which is your regular table salt but potassium potassium you can actually get it over the counter in any grocery store it's labeled as half salt or low sodium salt and if you really want to optimize how your potassium behaves in your body you should also make sure you're getting adequate amount of magnesium and calcium calcium you can get from digesting bones but magnesium not not the most available out there and even in the hospital those are the electrolytes that I replace the most through an IV your sodium your potassium and your magnesium now having those electrolytes will definitely be important for preventing cramps but super important for preventing that lightheaded feeling like you're passing out sensation as well because what happens there is you're likely not having enough blood flow or oxygen to the brain so that's what your brain's uh, telling your body to do not getting enough nutrients in the form of oxygen so I want you to pass out so that there's more blood going to the brain because your brain only gets supply from your heart that pushes it up when you're lying flat it's easier for your heart to push blood to your brain and if you're feeling like you're going to fall asleep or pass out when you're standing up that is a sure sign way of saying that there's not enough fluids because the fluids isn't able to transport that oxygen to the brain so what you want to be doing is drinking more number one having the electrolytes if you have and there are some maneuvers that you can do to minimize that feeling of lightheadedness number one you want to be contracting everything so your feet your thighs your butt your abdomen your chest your hands your arms and then changing position so that can be if you're really feeling lightheaded and you're severely dehydrated that maybe changes from lying down to sitting up where you have to do that and then sitting up to standing up it happens really common in our elderly patients because as soon as they stand up but not only are their hearts not as strong as younger people their veins are not as good as they used to be veins are one-way valves and it's your muscles that squeeze and push the blood back so that's what you're doing with contracting the muscles you're getting as much blood back to the heart so it can go to the brain and lastly if you are feeling like you're going to faint and fall down put yourself down don't try to wander anywhere and put your legs up on a tree so that allows that blood to flow from your legs which carries a lot of blood goes down to the heart and then it gets to your brain so that's an important way to know that you have a volume deficit and to confirm that you can fix it by increasing your water intake and supplementing your electrolytes if available all right 
right, so I hope you learned something from these videos. If you are enjoying these, please let me know in the comments and uh, please let me know how you think about this format. I found that I was uh, lagging behind with the recaps and not necessarily producing as much information as I wanted to on the medical side of things. So this way we are giving you some high quality information and it's not a huge rush to talk about every single contestant all at once. And again, if you notice something on Alone Season 9 that you really like gear wise, let me know and we as a team will reach out to those companies and have a huge giveaway at the season finale. This is Dr. Tan signing out.